Okay, well, good afternoon, and welcome to Scholarship. If you know me, I'm Danuna Nietzsche, Dean of Libraries, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to our Fall 2020 Scholarship event. So we are recording today's session. We ask you to stay muted till the end when we'll open up for questions and discussion. And I'm sure it'll be a lively one today. So Scholarship was launched in 2011 as part of the library's strategic goal to help build cross-disciplinary community at Drexel and to connect our dragons to scholarship. Each academic quarter, the event brings together faculty and professional staff colleagues from all colleges, schools, and many administrative departments for food for thought discussions around some interdisciplinary research conducted here and a toast to the end of each academic term. So unfortunately, we are still not able to gather together on campus due to the COVID-19, but I am pleased to have the option to utilize technology like Zoom to continue our scholarship tradition, at least in large part. So in fact, though, utilizing Zoom has made it possible for us to extend the invitation to our scholarship series to our friends outside the Drexel community, something that was not easily possible when hosted in person due to space and budgetary constraints. So welcome to those from other institutions and organizations around the country who logged in today. And I thank you all for joining us during these demanding and uncertain times and for your continued support with Drexel Libraries. So when it came time to select the theme for this year's scholarship series, the answer seemed obvious. Almost as soon as the pandemic started, Drexel researchers began creating new or adapting existing research projects in order to better understand COVID-19 and its impact on various communities. Of course, we had to explore this important work more broadly with all of us. So thus, I'm pleased to announce that this year's theme, this academic year's theme, is responding to COVID-19 through research and scientific problem solving. And I must say in that context, just a few minutes ago, I checked the, the reported data and it is rather sobering context that uh, we have just today, so far, nearly 90,000 new cases reported and over 700 deaths. And there's still another eight hours left on this day's count. So we're looking to confirm uh, some other speakers for the winter and spring, and we'll plan to announce those after the new year. But in the meantime, save March 15th for the winter scholarship gathering. So now I'm pleased to introduce today's thought-provoking speaker who will kick off our 2020 and 2021 series, Drexel Assistant Professor Usama Bilal. So Dr. Bilal is currently an assistant professor in the Urban Health Collaborative and the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Drexel's Dornsife School of Public Health. His primary research interest is the macrosocial determinants of health with a special interest in nutrition related conditions and their upstream causes. Most of his work focuses on the role that city and neighborhood level dynamics have in generating disease and the use of complexity methodologies to study the emergent properties of urban environments. Most recently, Professor Bilal contributed to the book Urban Public Health, a research toolkit for practice and impact, which was co-edited by three Drexel faculty members from Dornsite School of Public Health, Dean Anna Dues Ru and Professor Gina Lavasi and Professor Jennifer Kolker. So Professor, Professor Bilal earned a PhD in cardiovascular epidemiology from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, an MPH from the Universidad de Alcala in Spain, and his MD for the Universidad de Oviedo in Spain as well. So thank you again for joining us today, Usama. But before I turn the Zoom co-host function over to Dr. Brial, let us continue our scholarship tradition and virtually toast the end of this fall term and with it the end of 2020 as an academic year. So be kind, empathetic, and compassionate as you read those exam responses and file the final grades. Here's to it, here's here. So with that, Wasabi, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind uh, introduction and thank you uh, everyone for, uh, for being here uh, today uh, for this talk. Let me share screen if I can even uh, here. Okay. So if I could get confirmation that folks are seeing my full screen. Yes, they are. Okay, great. Thank you.
Okay, fantastic. So uh, today I want to uh, talk about uh, COVID-19, because that's, that's the overall topic of this, of this series, but also uh, with a big focus on inequities as a cause and consequence of COVID-19. And I want to do this from a global, per, global per perspective. I want to leverage some of the work that we are doing at the Urban Health Collaborative that is a, a global in nature. And I, and I want to provide an overview of these inequities uh, worldwide. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge some funding and some work by a lot of people that are at the, at the UHC. So funding from the National Institutes of Health, funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and also the fantastic work that other co-investigators, uh, staff, and research assistants and other students have been doing in the last few months, since mostly since March or April, when we started doing research uh, on this. I see uh, some of the names here in the list of people attending, so thank you so much for all of your work and for all of your uh, support and for all of your uh, labor. Um, so today I, I, I want to talk, I want to provide an overview of some research that we are conducting at the Urban Health Collaborative uh, with a focus on COVID-19 inequities and also to put this research in context with other research that is going on, COVID-19 uh, inequities. And I will start by framing the issue and the impacts that it has had and then talk about two key topics, uh, inequities or inequalities as a cause and as a consequence of COVID-19. I think this is a key thing to consider that not only we study how COVID-19 impacts uh, health inequities, which is what mostly us in health equity usually do, but it's also of interest to study how these inequities can have an impact of COVID-19 itself. So first of all, I want to start with a, you know, something that may seem obvious to most people, which is a, a question of what is COVID-19, right? And, and most people probably will give you an answer that you know, will be an extension of this, which is that it is an infectious disease that is caused by a, by a virus called SARS-CoV-2 uh, with some symptoms, given prognosis, a given treatment, etc. Actually, when I was back when I was in medical school, this is probably how a disease would have been presented to me back then. Now, I will argue that for the purposes of what I'm going to be talking about today, it's even more important to consider a, a second definition of COVID-19 uh, which is this one, um, and this is one I made up, but you know, it could be something similar to this, which is it's a sociopolitical historical event that has occurred in a specific historical context that has caused a mortality crisis with some specific uh, person, place, and time effects that has generated a response by public and private organizations that have their own social and economic impacts. So in other words, COVID-19 is not only uh, the... Uh, it's not only an infectious disease, it's also a historical event in itself. And it is the second part that I want to focus on the, for most of today, because we've seen this recurring nar narrative in, by many, especially public officials, a lot of them here in the U.S., that COVID-19 doesn't understand anything about social classes, right? And when you think of a virus, it's obvious that the virus doesn't understand social class, it doesn't understand race or, or, or ethnicity, it doesn't understand about where you live. But when instead of thinking about a virus, you think about the event itself, about the epidemic or the pandemic itself, then it becomes a little bit easier to see how these things may be influenced by the social environment in which we live. So I, I want to focus mostly on this second definition. And now, in order to focus on this second definition, I find it useful to start with what in epidemiology we usually focus on, which is person, place, and time, and try to understand who is affected by this, where, and when. And I will start with place by showing you this very easy table, nothing fancy here. This is just the mortality rate by COVID-19 uh, in uh, countries, and I've taken, I believe, the top 20 countries. I think these are 20. And I've sorted them by, uh, by the mortality rate, uh, this is all uh, from, the, from the Johns Hopkins tracker. And you can see on top there is Belgium, then it's Peru, Spain, my own country, Italy, Mas Macedonia, the UK, etc. And around the top 10, you find the US. Now, uh, I've colored in purple uh, countries in Latin America because I think this is an under-recognized under issue, which is that COVID-19 has had a huge effect in Latin America. And actually, you see Peru as the country with the second highest mortality rate, 
Argentina, Mexico in the top 10, and then in the top 20, you still see Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, and Panama. So I think this is something we need to be aware of. And the reason why I said it has had a very strong effect in Latin America is because, you know, as someone from Spain, as someone that knows more or less Italy and other European countries, I know that these are countries with a lot of aging. But at the same time, I know that these Latin American countries that I'm showing here, they are not, they don't have that phenomenon, that strong phenomenon of aging. So that the average age of someone living in Peru and Argentina is much lower than someone living in Spain and Italy. And actually I'm showing here on the right, the median age in each of these countries. And you can actually see that the countries, Latin American countries we are highlighting have a very low median age compared to the European countries in this table. And we know that age is the most important risk factor for, for, for that, so what I'm trying to say here is that these Latin American countries, even when uh, they have a, a on average, a, a very young po population, they still have had a, an enormous uh, mortality impact by COVID-19. And I think we will only fully recognize this once we have complete vital registration statistics as the year is over. And that's when we will realize that this has been a very, 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 um, impactful pandemic in, in Latin America, especially. I'm not saying it hasn't been like that everywhere else, but what I'm saying is that Latin America has suffered uh, the, the worst of the, of the pandemic. Uh, the second aspect I want to talk about is time and how important time it is in this, in this pandemic. And for this, I wanna uh, focus on an example that we published recently on the impact of COVID-19 in the Spanish regions over time during the first wave. So what I'm showing here uh, on the y-axis is life expect weekly life expectancy at birth, uh, where you normally prefer that to be high. So higher on this figure is better and lower is worse. Um, and on the x-axis, we show time. In this case, every week from January through June, first half of the 2020 year. And I'm showing for the whole of Spain and for the three biggest regions, Andalusia in the south, Catalonia in the northeast, and Madrid in the center, which also happens to be the capital. Now, life expectancy uh, is a, it, actually a great summary measure of mortality because it summarizes the entire experience of mortality in a population. And you normally define it as what, what will be someone born today, how long are they expected to live on, on average, if they were to experience the mortality patterns that we are experiencing today uh, over their lifetime. And what we see here is that the mortality crisis was so acute, especially in Madrid, Spain, that actually uh, for the worst weeks of the epidemic, which in the case of Madrid were around mid-March or uh, late March, uh, people lost on average 10 to 15 years of life expectancy. That's a huge mortality crisis uh, that uh, experience had an ex 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 uh, experience in a week during the entire history of, of Spain almost. We actually have to go back to the 1918 influenza pandemic to even have, find something similar. And actually, um, we've updated this analysis. This is not included in the paper, but we've recently updated this, this analysis and found that during the entire year, Spain lost around two years of life expectancy for the whole year, for the whole country. This is the worst fall that Spain has had in life expectancy since the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. So this has been how impactful this has been in, in, in Spain. Now, that's in terms of time. We can see how the pandemic has had differential effects over time. What about in terms of person? And I'm, I'm going to focus most of what is coming now in terms of, of, of those differences between different population subgroups. But I want to highlight that with the following figure. In this figure, um, I'm showing data obtained from the CDC here in the US and showing data for three racial ethnic groups. In this case, in blue, I'm showing non-Hispanic whites. In uh, black, I'm showing Hispanics, and in red, I'm showing uh, blacks or, or African Americans. And what, what, I'm, what I'm showing here is for the whole country, what has been mortality by COVID-19 by age group, starting down here with zero to four years of age, then five to 14, and et cetera, et cetera, in 10 year increments. And what we see here, first, first of all, is a pattern that we expect, which is mortality is higher as age goes up, and we, we've known this by, uh, a, because that's how mortality generally operates, and B, because we know that COVID-19 is especially impactful in the, in, the, in the elderly, so we see that mortality is higher up here. 
But we also see something very, very important, which is the difference between the, the blue dots and the, and the black and red dots, which are, these are huge differences. And I want to, I want to point you towards the, the x-axis here, which is the mortality rate, which as we usually do when we plot mortality rates by age, we are plotting in the log scale. In this case, in the log 10 scale. What that means is that the difference between each uh, vertical line here is a tenfold difference. So what that means is that, for example, for people aged 35 through 44, the mortality rates of Black and Hispanics are actually almost 10 times higher than the mortality rate of, of, of whites. This is a huge, huge disparity. And this is the consequence of COVID-19 exacerbating disparities that we had already seen uh, before, that we knew already existed, and what COVID-19 is doing is just exacerbating these and making them even, even worse than, than what we knew. And from what we see here, that's especially the case in the younger or young adult age groups. Now, why, why, is, why is this happening? Well, uh, for that, I want to show a very simplified framework of, um, of how uh, we believe that this is operating. And this framework uses uh, what uh, in epidemiology we sometimes define as SEIR models. But I'm not going to go into the modeling aspect of this. I'm just going to use this as a, as a tool to help us understand where, where inequities are happening. These SEIR models usually tend to focus on a population that is susceptible, that then gets exposed to a uh, virus or whatever disease and gets infected and then gets recovered or not, or doesn't recover. And uh, what I, why, the reason why I find this framework useful is because it allows us to see where things are operating. In this case, uh, we believe that the social determinants of health, some of these uh, aspects are operating by making people more susceptible, making people, sorry, making people more exposed, not more susceptible, making people more, more exposed here. Then if exposed, making them more likely to be infected. And if they are infected, making them less likely to recover afterwards. So these are three potential areas where the social determinants of health may be operating. But not only that, but the control and mitigation measures that we are implementing, either as individuals, as uh, public uh, actors or as private actors, someone is, 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 is taking these measures uh, with more or less A, efficiency and B, intensity, they operate in several aspects. And one of them is by changing the social determinants of health themselves, you can think of the unemployment benefits or things like this, or B, by reducing exposure. Those are two of the key aspects that control and mitigation measures are, are designed to. And today I, I want to focus on, on two of these aspects. One of them is that COVID-19 is exacerbating pre-existing health inequities. I kind of mentioned that a moment ago. And B, that social inequality in general complicates COVID-19 control. So that all of these control and mitigation measures are complicated by social in, in, inequality. And to, um, to make the, uh, the argument for these two points, I'll show some of the research we've, we've been conducting, and I'll also put it in context of other, other research. So first of all, I, I want to talk about the narrative. And I want to talk about the narrative because this, I believe, is one of the most important things that we can do in public health, which is tackling the narrative, you know, focusing on why things are happening and focusing on, on trying to uh, change the, the, the existing narrative. And I want to show you a quote by the Minister of Health of, of Chile. The quote is in Spanish, but it's quite easy. And uh, it's, the, it's the minister, whose last name is Paris, doesn't have anything to do with the city, talks about people that have died of COVID-19. And the minister says that there is no relationship between lethality and poverty, because that will mean that patients are being uh, at, uh, are taken care of in a, in a discriminatory way, so that poor people are being, the, the care that they receive is worse than the care that wealthier people uh, show. Now, what this, if this were to be the case, then what we will find is that the existing inequities in Chile will be similar pre and post COVID-19 or pre COVID-19 and during COVID-19. So we did a very simple analysis with the data that Chile makes public. And we look at the relationship between um, area level education and mortality before COVID-19 and during 2020. Uh, and these are the results here. What we see on the x-axis is the average years of schooling that people in every neighborhood of Santiago de Chile, um, the capital of Chile, has. 
And what, so to the, to the right, it will be people, uh, areas with higher average years of schooling. More than 12 will be people that have on average more than just high school. Less than that will be uh, areas where people have on average less than high school. And then on the y-axis, we see the, the age-adjusted mortality rate. And what we see here is that, for, first of all, in the three years before the pandemic uh, started, there are, there are some inequities, so that the higher the average years of schooling, the lower the mortality. So that's a health inequity, one that we had already described before. But importantly, what we see is that this slope is actually strengthened uh, becomes even 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 more steep in 2020, so that the these pre-existing health inequities that were occurring in Santiago de in Santiago de Chile are actually exacerbated with COVID-19. Now, one of the things we did to kind of explore this a little bit more is say, okay, let's let's in a way divide the figure on the right over the figure on the left. So what we did is let's calculate excess mortality in 2020, so how many more deaths have there been in each neighborhood during 2020, during the pandemic, and let's compare that with two variables that, um, that are related to socioeconomic status in these areas. So we look at, uh, on the left, the proportion of people with uh, university education or above, and on the right, the proportion of households living in overcrowding. And in both cases, we found that Areas that had either higher, uni higher proportion of people with university ed education, and on the right, areas that have a lower proportion of people with overcrowding, living in overcrowded conditions, both aspects were associated with lower mortality. So that indeed, it, it looks like during the COVID-19 pan pandemic, the main effects have been felt on areas with, um, with more overcrowding, with lower levels of education, in general areas with higher deprivation. Now, this is not just something that is happening in Chile, of course. For example, this is an example of uh, another Latin American country, in this case, Lima in Peru, where we plotted on the left excess mortality, where a darker red color means higher excess mortality. And on the right, two variables, uh, university education and overcrowding. And what we find is that this cluster here of areas with higher in Lima, this cluster here of areas with higher levels of education and lower levels of overcrowding, are actually the areas with the lowest levels of excess mortality. So again, another city, very different city, very different setting where we find the same result. Um, mortality tends to have increased the most. Mortality during the COVID pandemic tends to have increased the most in areas with uh, more deprivation or with lower socioeconomic status. Another example of this, and this is close to home in my case, literally, this is my region in, in, in Spain called Asturias, Northwest Spain very green, very beautiful region, has done things pretty well regarding COVID, but we still find the same pattern. In this case, it's a little bit hard to see, but what I'm showing here is the proportion in green, the proportion of people that got COVID-19 that are defined by the health system as living in deprived conditions. And the indicator there, it means that they don't pay any copayment for their medicines because they don't earn enough money to pay that copayment. Uh, and that's compared down here with the proportion of people living in, in deprivation among the general population. What we find is that everyone that is not retired, which is from this line to the, to the, to the right, where the indicator of copayment gets a little bit uh, sketchy, anything on the left here, we find a very strong association between deprivation and COVID-19 uh, COVID incidents. Now, that's Latin America, that's Spain, very different settings, what is happening here in the US. So for that, I want to show results from a analysis that uh, we've done at the, at the Urban Health Collaborative and at, the, um, and, at the, um, and at the School of Public Health, Dornsef School of Public Health, looking at three cities in the US and looking at four indicators of COVID-19 impact in these three cities. The three cities are Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia. And the three indicators, the four indicators, one of them is testing rates, the other one is positivity ratios, which are the proportion of tests that are positive. The other one is incidence, so just the, the number of cases per uh, thousand people. And the other one is incidence, which is the number of cases and the number of deaths per thousand people. And we've done this in, by zip code in these three cities. And we've compared these four indicators with the social vulnerability index, which is a, an index that the CDC has created uh, to, um, 
as a marker of uh, area level vulnerability to pandemics or other natural disasters. So we thought this would be an ideal indicator in this case. And we find several things here. This figure is obviously quite busy, but uh, just so we show an example that is close to home, let's look at Philadelphia, let's look at positivity, which is the proportion of tests that are positive in a, in a given zip code. What we find is that areas with higher vulnerability have a higher positivity ratio. They also tend to have a lower testing, which kind of goes hand in hand with the positivity ratio, and they also tend to have higher incidence. Now, something we didn't find very clearly in Philadelphia is a gradient of mortality. Now, this gradient of mortality appears the moment we start considering that areas um, with uh, higher vulnerability tend to be also areas with a younger population, so that we will spec a lower mortality in those areas anyway. So that if we don't take into consideration the effect of age, we don't really see any association in Philadelphia. Now, for New York City and Chicago, we observe very similar patterns uh, in that positivity and incidence and mortality, too, are higher in areas with higher vulnerability. So, in summary, what we are finding here is that areas of higher social vulnerability in Chicago, New York City, and Philadelphia tend to have worse COVID-19 outcomes. Now, we could look at this, uh, spatially speaking, uh, this is part of the same research where, where we've done look for clusters of these four variables in each of the cities. And we observe very roughly very similar patterns looking at positivity in Philadelphia when it, where it's quite clear that center city and northwest Philadelphia tend to have lower positivity while north and northeast Philadelphia tend to have higher positivity. Similar results in the case of Chicago and New York City, with, for example, in New York City, uh, finding that uh, uh, most of Manhattan and adjacent areas of Brooklyn tend to have lower positivity, while uh, parts, of the, parts of the Bronx and Queens tend to have higher positivity. This has also changed over time. I, I won't spend a lot of time in this figure, but what this shows is the association between social vulnerability and uh, three of these indicators over time. Uh, what we find here essentially is that over the course of the pandemic, social vulnerability has been associated with higher positivity uh, consistently in the three cities over time without too much vari variation in that. Now the associations with incidents have changed over time and the reason, the key reason why they have changed over time is because the availability of testing has changed over time. So what we have found, and this is especially the case in Philadelphia, is that consistently over time, areas with higher vulnerability have lower testing. And I think this is something that we eventually, uh, we are gonna have to work hard to address. Now, uh, focusing a little bit more on Philadelphia, I want to highlight some of the work that folks at the UHC have been doing. Here is work, uh, a brief that uh, Dr. Barber and other colleagues at the UHC have, have published on COVID-19 and segregation. Well, also let you know that we are working on a COVID-19 among the Latinx population in Philadelphia brief that we hope to be able to release in the following uh, month or, or so. This is one of the figures that we are showing there, where we show that the, that, and that, that the Latinx population of Philadelphia actually has the highest incidence, hospitalization, and, mor and mortality rate, with huge disparities, especially compared to the non-Hispanic white population of, of Philadelphia. So that's a little bit of zooming in. Just to close this part, I want to zoom out a little bit and show you um, a figure that, a, that I prepared for an, for an essay I published in a, in, a, in a Spanish magazine. This is why the thing is in, in, in Spanish. But I want to show you this so we see the universality of these COVID-19 inequities. This is uh, what we did here is mostly take data from five different studies. Uh, completely different studies where we look at uh, COVID-19 outcomes and either uh, income or, de or deprivation going from the wealthiest to the poorest areas. And we find that regardless of whether you are in Barcelona, Chicago, Philadelphia, uh, England, or New York, the lower or the higher your, the deprivation of your area or the lower the income of your area, the higher your your either incidence, your positivity, your hospitalization, or your mortality rates. So regardless of where you are, and if I were to add, if I were to add, update this with uh, Santiago and Lima, we'll probably find the same things. Regardless of where you are, it seems that it's quite clear that people with lower socioeconomic status or people living in area with lower socioeconomic status have worse COVID-19 outcomes. And last, 
thing I want to mention today is the second aspect of my argument, which is that social inequity complicates COVID-19 control. And for this, I want to measure, I want to focus on two aspects we've been doing research on, which is uh, mo mobility associated with COVID-19 outcomes. Um, and for that, I want to show you some research we've done in, in, in Spain, especially in the metropolitan area of Madrid, where we use cell phone uh, mo mobility data uh, to compare uh, mo mobility patterns before and during the pandemic and before and during the lockdown. So what we see here on the left is what was happening in Madrid in November of last year. So no COVID, no one knew nothing about COVID. And what was happening there was roughly that mobility was a slightly socially patterned so that uh, areas with higher deprivation had a slightly, ever so a slightly lower mo mo mobility, but you know, there, there wasn't much of an association there. Now, what happens during the lockdown, which in Spain was called, uh, was called the economic hibernation period by the poetic name, what happened during the lockdown was that we started finding a strong association between mobility and deprivation. So that areas with the highest dep deprivation have higher mo mobility. Now, overall, there was a big decline in mobility, as you can see, but that decline was especially strong in areas with lower deprivation. Now, as the economy started to reopen, this association strengthened even more. So that during phase one and phase two of the reopening, which were right after the lockdown, we find an even stronger association. So that the uh, areas with higher de deprivation had even higher mo mobility. And if we actually compute relative indicators so that we look at how mobility change compared to baseline, what we find is that this uh, social pattern of increased mobility uh, was especially strong during the uh, reopening of the, of the economy. So that it seems that the people that reopened the economy were actually the people living in, in, the, uh, in these higher deprivation areas, which is mostly essential and frontline workers that cannot telecommute, whose work does not allow for, for telecommute. Now, if we look at this especially, uh, this is the metropolitan area of, Mad of Madrid. And what we are showing here in the, in the, in the lighter colors are the areas in which mo mobility dropped the least during the lockdown. So areas that were still having some, mo some mobility going on there. And uh, the reason why I'm showing this map, which won't make any sense for, for most people, is because this map looks very similar to a map that was then used by, by the regional government of Madrid to enforce uh, neighborhood level lockdowns in September of this year. And they enforce these neighborhood level lockdowns because these were areas with higher incidence. Now, these areas of higher incidence that the, that the government of Madrid enforced and neighborhood lockdown on are exactly the same areas of high mobility during the hibernation period. What this means is that uh, probably part of the reason why these areas had higher incidence is because these areas have more frontline workers that need to continue going to, to work and cannot telecommute. Now, this pattern that we have reported for Madrid is similar to a pattern in Latin America. What I'm showing here is very preliminary research conducted by Josiah Kephart, who is a postdoc at the UHC, and other uh, collaborators in UC Berkeley and other parts of Latin America, where they have looked at uh, trends in mobility with the lockdown, which is this big drop here, and with the reopening of the economy, in uh, 300 cities in Latin America. And what they found is that areas of high SES actually keep the lowest mobility over time because they don't really need to go back in person to this, to this work, et cetera, because in some cases they can telecommute, in some cases they don't even need to go to work. While all of the other areas still show this pattern of increased mobility. This is similar in the, in the, in the US. This is uh, some research con, uh, published recently in Nature Human Behavior where the researchers look at very similar data and find that the proportion of people staying at home during the lockdown in the US and the proportion of people having to leave their uh, areas uh, was uh, the proportion of people staying at home was highest in the highest team brackets and the proportion of people having to go to work was uh, lowest in the highest income brackets. So very similar pattern here in the, in the, in the US. 
Now, I want to close with just two ideas of what could be potential solutions here with two pieces of research that have been published in the last few months. Um, first one of them is this research looking at uh, emergency sick leave policies, uh, which the authors found that states that enacted emergency sick leave policies had lower incidence. So that's one way where we can try to tackle social inequality to COVID uh, pathways. This is definitely one of them. The other one, when it comes to mitigation, is uh, unionization. And I find this uh, article, it's a great piece of research, um, where they look at mortality rates from COVID-19 in unionized versus non-unionized nursing homes, where they found that unionized nursing homes had 30% lower mortality compared to non-unionized nursing homes, and they found that a key mediator was access to, to PPE in this one. So two ideas there. I know they are not the most revolutionary ideas, should be key things, unionization at basic leave, but uh, they are definitely seem to be helping in some cases with COVID-19. So in summary, what I wanted to show to you today was an overview of some of the research that we are conducting at the UHC in terms of COVID-19 inequities, put it in context with other COVID-19 uh, research. And I hope to have at least kind of started to convince you of the importance of uh, studying health inequities, both as being exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and as a consequence of the COVID-19, as, as a cause of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, itself. So uh, thank you, and I, will, I welcome any question or comment that you may have. Thank you very much. And I think um, let's, let's try to just see who, whoever would like to um, pose a question to either raise up their hand. Let me go here to the full screen here and see. Um, I see Kathleen, you've got your hand up. Do you want to get started with the questions? Just unmute yourself. I was just really intending to applaud. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, we could all certainly do that too. <laughs> but do we have any questions or somebody, why don't you, because I can't see everybody's uh, face on one screen right now. So why don't you just go ahead and, um, and until we get too many others, go ahead and unmute yourself and pose a question or comment. So I, ha I have a question. This was a wonderful talk. My name is Ramesh Raghupati. I'm from the College of Medicine. Um, so so uh, one question I have for you is, as you compare the data from the different countries and di across different continents, and, and you compare the, uh, the, the economic uh, state, status, are there any commonalities in terms of, yes, the commonality that you have presented is in the context of the COVID-19, the, the pandemic, and, and, I, and I recognize that, but what about aspects related to access to healthcare? Are there any lessons we can learn from each other? Uh, or is it, is it something that there's uniformly everything's got to be improved? Or are there certain things that despite the best efforts, there is a problem uh, kind of uh, issue? Do you, I, 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 so, uh, do you understand what I'm asking? I mean, it's... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite the, thank you for the question, it's quite the tricky question, especially in an international context, because generally uh, anything that requires comparing different countries in terms of healthcare access is tricky, right? Because uh, the healthcare system of Spain is very different from the healthcare system of the US, different from the one in Chile, different from the one in Peru, etc. Now, one of the things we've noticed with our research is, the, is that... Um, in some of these cases, especially the countries that have a very fragmented healthcare system, and I'm including here, uh, for example, Peru, for example, I haven't shown, but we've done some research in Mexico. In all of these countries, the COVID-19 data is quite tricky to use because since the system is so fragmented, access to testing is extremely limited. And actually, I've um, right now in Philadelphia, I believe we have like a 10% positivity or something like, like that. And we are quite worried about the 10% positivity, right? In, in September, we had a 1% to 2%, which was great. Mexico hasn't gone lower than 40% throughout the entire pandemic. It doesn't mean that Mexico has a ton of cases, which it does, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It means that its healthcare system is being unable to, uh, to provide for a lot of those tests, which ends up meaning that our data on Mexico level incidence, in, on, on area level incidence in Mexico, is very hard to use because of that fragmented healthcare system. So while it, that doesn't speak to how the healthcare system affects COVID-19, 
it speaks to how the healthcare system affects our research on COVID-19, which makes it then tricky to, to study how the healthcare system itself affects COVID-19. Now, back in April, I believe, when the thing was, everything was starting to start, etc., one of the patterns that we observe, and we haven't followed through with this research because of other things, is that uh, areas of Italy that had, uh, had higher most intensive privatization, healthcare privatization efforts in the, in the reforms of the 2000s, had actually the highest mortality of all of the areas in, in, because of COVID-19, of all of the areas in, in, in Italy. Now, is this a strong compounding? Is this a consequence of the privatization of the healthcare system in those areas? We cannot really say because we haven't continued with this research, but that's definitely something to look at. And I have to say from our experience in Spain, uh, some of the most affected areas in Spain, this is very ane anecdotal, but some of the most affected areas in Spain were the areas that had, that kind of went from the national healthcare system, uh, very UK based, uk light healthcare system that most regions in Spain have to a more privatized system. So again, causal or not causal, we are observing those patterns. <laughs> I can't see if anyone else is trying to say. If not, I'd, I'd like to toss in a question. And uh, Danuta Nitetsky, um, do you see uh, any insights either from the, your approach to this research or from some of your research itself, how this might shed um, light on prioritizing vaccination once that's going to be more available? That's a, that's, that's a great question. <laughs> and I will, uh, it's not like I'm punting the question, but I, I will recommend that uh, the our our very dean of the School of Public Health, Dr. Dieru, was part of the National Academy of Sciences or Medicine, I'm mixing them both, uh, report or panel that actually uh, gave some recommendations of, on that. And that's, that's a great report that I recommend people take, 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 take a look at. Now, one of the things we are trying to do now uh, with one of the new projects is trying to start a little bit of tracking of where the vaccines are going in terms of equity. Right? Like if we know that certain populations are more likely to have a higher incidence of COVID-19, should we prioritize those populations? That's a question. Now, uh, whether that's something that we should do or not, I don't think falls in the realm of epidemiology. I think that's a uh, values answer that has a political answer, what we prioritize as a society. Now, what I want to say is that if social inequality leads to higher incidence, as we seem to find more and more evidence, then addressing that social inequality through our vaccine policy may be a good way to reducing incidence further. In other words, if we see that frontline workers, let's say teachers, and cashiers, um, and then all of the healthcare, of course, uh, grocery store clerks, uh, tra transportation workers, etc., have the highest risk, and they are also um, therefore the ones with the highest incidence, then focusing on those groups may actually be beneficial for the whole society in general. An alternative to that is focusing on groups that uh, if they get the disease will have the worst consequences, the elderly, people with comorbidities, etc. Somewhere in there lies the, the best strategy, but I think that should we prioritize one or the other, it's a political question rather than an epidemiological one. Now, I have my opinion, which is focus on frontline workers, and on reducing inequities, but that's my opinion. That's different. That, that's how I will vote, <laughs> in, in other words. Thank you. Any other questions to throw into the discussion? I know there's several of you here in the field and could help us understand this a little more. I, I you know, I'm, I'm just going to answer a question that hasn't been asked, but I always, this is a good opportunity to, to give an extra comment, which is the importance of schools for equity. <laughs> and I think we need to be very aware of this, that uh, uh, primary schools, there was a great paper published in the summer um, where uh, titled Reopening of Primary Schools During the Pandemic. And I think this is something we need to think hard about as a society. What is the impact of continuing having a schools closed, both for children, for parents, for people that attend? Because in Philadelphia, both public and private schools are, well, 
it may be reclosing at some point, but they are technically open. Uh, and the fact that only one of them is actually open uh, for in-person instruction and the other is not is something we just need to think about as a society, is that a desirable outcome or not. So uh, I, I, that's something that since the beginning, I think uh, we've been trying to highlight, which is we really need to think of primary schools, secondary in a way too, but primary schools especially, as one of the most important care systems in our society. So how their buildings are built, how, how much money is put into them is, a, is public health. And that's something I think we need to be very aware of. <laughs>